I believe that when this story comes to be related in future history, it will meet with unbelief and indignation. For had I not bear witness to the fact on that fatal day, I should scarcely have given credit to it even now. George Washington, August 2nd, 1755. On today's episode, we delve into the ill-fated expedition led by General Edward Braddock during the French and Indian War. Before we get started, please, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, ring the bell so that you can get notified anytime I upload a new episode. And please make sure to give this video a simple thumbs up. This channel is halfway to a thousand subscribers and I would absolutely love for this audience to grow to a thousand by the new year. So a simple thumbs up, a comment, share with a friend, really helps this video in the algorithm. And it really helps Historical USA to be pushed out to other history buffs like yourselves. If you're actually watching this on Spotify, because I do upload a video of this to Spotify and to Substack, please share. I would absolutely love to get those downloads up more as well. And I have some exciting news. Also, I have started a Patreon. Now, this was something I wasn't sure I wanted to do, but I had several people message me asking if I would do one. This is something that you feel is value to you, what I am doing here, my podcast, whether it is educational, interesting to you, and it is of worth to you. Please consider being a patron over there on my Patreon. As a member, you will get your name listed on my videos and be privy to some exclusive content over there. So if that is something that is interested to you, uh, click the link in the description box below. For this episode, my research comes from mainly three books. Braddock's Defeat by David L. Preston, The French and Indian War, Deciding the Fate of North America by Walter R. Bornman, and Benjamin Franklin, the classic by Walter Isaacson. In 1755, Braddock, a seasoned British officer, set out with a force of over a thousand men to capture the French fort of Duquesne. But the rugged American wilderness would prove to be a formidable foe. After receiving reports from his quartermaster, St. Clair, General Braddock had organized a meeting with colonial governors in Alexandria, Virginia. Braddock had hoped that the plan he laid out for this expedition into the Ohio would be received with full financial and military support from the royal governors. Fortunately, though, the meeting did not go as he had hoped it would. St. Clair had already warned Braddock about the lack of cooperation in retrieving military supplies thus far. And this meeting cemented Braddock's suspicions regarding the colony's cooperation on this matter, and feelings of contempt towards the colonists would only grow within him. Though he may not have liked it, unfortunately he had to rely on the colonies in order for him to fulfill the mission that was tasked before him. See, Braddock needed to carry an army of at least 2,500 British regulars and colonial troops 300 miles through treacherous terrain in enemy territory. The undertaking would be a logistical nightmare. For months, the French had been securing their defenses at Fort Duquesne in the Ohio. They had also been fortifying their alliances with native tribes. This would be Braddock's folly. Well, Braddock relied on the colonies to give him what he needed by way of troops and supplies, he greatly neglected and underestimated the support he would need from the indigenous people within the area. As I mentioned in the last episode, Tana Charison, the half king was now dead and the Iroquois in Ohio had virtually abandoned the British for the French or they took their ball completely and went home refusing to play for either side. Braddock did not see the value in allying his army with the natives. And honestly, the natives could tell right away that Braddock had already formed prejudices against them. So 
When Braddock set up his base of operations at Fort Cumberland, only 100 Delaware warriors would join the British. Braddock would be disappointed with how many Delaware had shown up at Cumberland. When asked by the Delaware chieftain, Shingus, what would become of the French territory if the French were pushed out, Braddock replied, quote, well, the English should inhabit and inherit the land, and no savage will inherit it. Shingus replied, well, if they might not have liberty to live on the land, they would not fight for it. Braddock responded by dismissing the Delaware Indians from Cumberland, claiming he did not need the Indians help to drive the French and their native allies out of Ohio. Of course, word would travel pretty quickly among native tribes that Braddock was not a man you wanted to do business with. From here on out, it would be difficult for Braddock to find native scouts or guides for his army. And those that did help did so very reluctantly. Now Braddock may have made the fatal error in not relying on Native Americans, but the French would not make that same mistake. As I said, they were creating treaties and securing Native allies while Braddock was losing them. The French relied on Native American guides as scouts and learned guerrilla tactics that the British were just not used to fighting. Braddock though would have some help and he would be accompanied by a 23 year old aide by the name of George Washington who had volunteered for the position. Braddock would also meet with the Pennsylvania postmaster, Benjamin Franklin, who was able to procure some wagons and a few supplies that Braddock desperately needed. Supplies that the colonial governors had failed to give him. On May 29th, 1755, Braddock departed Fort Cumberland and began the 110 mile journey to Fort Duquesne with his army. By his side would be future Revolutionary War generals Thomas Gage, Charles Lee, Horatio Gates, Daniel Morgan, and Daniel Boone. General Braddock had sent 600 men commanded by Major Russell Chapman of the 44th Regiment of Foot as an advance party to prepare a route for his march. The party included his quartermaster general, Sir John St. Clair, two engineers, a Lieutenant Spedlow of the Royal Navy, and a few reluctant Indian guides. They were tasked to clear a 12 foot wide path from Fort Cumberland to Fort Necessity. This was not an easy task. There were no navigable waterways along the route, which meant that all cross country movement would require a huge chunk of time and physical effort. Bridges would need to be made and timber would need to be felled. It would take nine days for Braddock's army to move just 25 miles. Braddock could not sustain his force at this pitiful rate of advance. Braddock may have had an impressive career in the British Army. He severely lacked experience in combat and lacked particularly experience in the North American wilderness. It is very apparent that as Braddock organized his men into columns, he was relying on fighting as if he was in Europe and not on the Monongahela. As the fife and drum beat the Grenadiers March, Braddock and his forward column moved across the Monongahela River, abandoning any surprise or secrecy. As General Braddock ordered Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Gage, who we will see later at Lexington Green, to speed ahead with a hand-picked body of men in various units, he would only make it seven miles from Duquesne before he would be attacked by 900 Canadian Marines, militia, and Ottawa, Shawnee, Delaware, and Mingo Indians. The French commander, Daniel Bejou, dressed as a Native American, bare-chested and covered in war paint, would be killed instantly by the British. As the Canadians panicked, the natives fell back into the woods on both sides of the road. Using guerrilla tactics, the British would crumble as they were picked off by the natives on both sides. The British could not see where their attacks were coming from in the woods, and they retreated back down the hill, colliding with Braddock's second column. Braddock commanded his men to fight in a linear style on the road, the road that would soon turn scarlet with blood, 
as casualties from the British mounted. As Braddock desperately tried to maintain order and rally his men to stand and fight, he was severely wounded. The British would flee back to their base camp, Camp Dunbar. The Battle of the Monongahela was over and nearly 900 British and provincial soldiers were killed, wounded, captured, or missing. As the French allied native warriors swarmed the road, scalping as many British soldiers as they could and giving the hatchet to those wounded, the army would retreat to Fort Cumberland. Braddock would succumb to his wounds on July 13th. He would be laid to rest in the middle of his road, Braddock's Road. George Washington, who had somehow miraculously escaped injury, even though his coat was riddled with bullet holes, would read a short sermon during Braddock's burial. The command of the British force was now left in the charge of Colonel Dunbar, the highest ranking surviving officer. Dunbar chose that instead of reorganizing his men and trying to take Fort Duquesne again, he would pull his army back to Philadelphia and go into winter quarters. The Royal Governor of Virginia was appalled that Dunbar would go into winter quarters. And Robert Dinwiddie would petition the House of Burgesses to fund and send out a Virginia regiment to the frontier, a regiment whose command he offered to George Washington. Washington immediately set out to establish headquarters at Winchester, Virginia. He would, though, have a very difficult time recruiting and supplying troops. He had also a very difficult time keeping men in the service who were recruited or drafted. Men were deserting in large numbers. Why? Well, the reason for this was the militia laws that had been set up by the House of Burgesses. In a letter to Dinwiddie, Washington decried that the laws were written so as to exempt wealthy or even middle-class men from military service. The laws disproportionately were aimed at drafting the extremely poor. This also meant that the quality of men that he was receiving was ineffective. He wrote, I see the growing insolence of the soldiers, the indolence, the inactivity of the officers. I can plainly see that under our present establishment, we shall become a nuance, an unsupportable charge to our country and never answer anyone's exception of the assembly. As many of those men we have got are really in a matter unfit to duty and were received more through necessity than choice. And I will very badly bear our examination. Also, the enlistment for these men was incredibly short. It virtually made their service unreliable. Washington continued to write, these militia being raised only for a month lose half the time in marchings out and home, especially those who come from adjacent counties who must be on duty sometime before they reach their station, by which means double sets of men are in pay at the same time and for the same service. To make matters even worse for Washington, support for this war in North America among the colonists was very unpopular. Those that would desert the military were also aided and hidden by the citizenry. In one instance, Washington even wrote that a local mob had rioted and freed several deserters from a local jail. Settlers even threatened to, in Washington's words, blow out my brains. Washington's real mission in all of this was not just to try and take war to the French on the Ohio, but it really was to execute a strategy to protect and maintain Virginia's frontier. Because of Braddock's defeat, the frontier was now left completely vulnerable for many of the English colonies. Natives would mount hit and run attacks on frontier settlements and isolated towns. Settlers were fleeing the frontier, abandoning their farms and retreating into the cities or larger settlements. The ill-fated expedition of General Edward Braddock will serve as a poignant reminder of the challenges faced by the British in their quest for dominance in the American colonies. Ultimately, Braddock's sacrifice and the hard-learned lessons from his expedition paved the way for future success in the American Revolution. And though life on the frontier in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia was about to get a whole lot more difficult, Colonel William Johnson had begun to carry out his campaign on the French to the north with the help of Robert Rogers 
and his rangers. Thanks for watching this video exploring Edward Braddock's ill-fated expedition. And shout out to our new Patreon members. Thank you, Travis, for being a founder. And thank you, Amy, for being a revolutionary, supporting my work and supporting the podcast. And don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe as we continue down this road to revolution. Bye.